New is always better. Well, or at least that's what you might think. But what if we told you that structures and buildings that are several centuries or even millennia old are still in use today? What if even modern engineers draw inspiration from the architectural masterpieces of the ancient world? Well, then we would have arrived at the exciting topic of today's video. From the extraordinary testimonies of the Nazca culture, to a superlative tunnel construction, to the Great Wall of China, we will show you why you can still learn a great deal from the construction wonders of the past. The Nazca culture is best known for its colossal geoglyphs. No wonder, because the so-called Nazca lines, with dimensions of up to 20 kilometers, defy all common size categories. Since they can only be seen in their full splendor from a bird's eye view, many an alternative thinker believes that they are scratchings that were once marveled at by aliens in the flesh on board their spaceships. Apart from this, the indigenous inhabitants of Peru have also left us with quite remarkable testimonies. Testimonies that are still in use today. More specifically, these are the Aqueducts of Cantaloc, or also Piquas, which are among the oldest irrigation systems in the entire Andean region. Built between 800 BC and 650 AD, this extensive and ingenious system brings cool water from underground sources to one of the driest areas in the world, and has thus provided the basis for the survival of many people in the region for thousands of years. The systems generally consist of a combination of open and closed underground channels, with the latter often accessed via spiral entrances. And while as many as 43 of these ancient irrigation systems were still in agricultural use at the beginning of the 21st century, many of them have been left to their own devices and reclaimed by nature in the recent past, or even misused as a rubbish tip. A Prime Example of Roman Engineering the Pont du Gard, in the south of France, is a further testament to the skill of the ancients in the art of water transportation. Although the word skill is an understatement in this case. Completed in the first century AD, over 1,000 people are said to have worked on the aqueduct for three years. However, the Pont du Gard did not stand alone, but was part of a larger water pipeline that the Romans built over a length of 50 kilometers between the present-day cities of Uzes and Nimes. And although the two cities are only 20 kilometers apart as the crow flies, the pipes had to overcome some natural obstacles such as hills and valleys, which is why the actual distance ultimately more than doubled. The difference in altitude between the source and the city of Nimes was only 17 meters, which in turn results in a gradient of 34 centimeters per kilometer. And this is precisely where the ingenuity of the structure lies. The Romans actually managed to maintain this low grade over the entire length of 50 kilometers. To do this, mountains were bypassed or tunnels were driven through them, and river valleys were crossed with bridges, without deviating from the low gradient. In the same breath, however, the gradient in curves had to be lower than the gradient on straight sections so that the pressure of the water conveyed would not become too high at these points. And indeed, the amount of water in question was quite something. After all, the pipeline transported around 20,000 liters of water from A to B every day. With a total height of almost 50 meters and a length of 275 meters, the Pont de Garde is the most famous section of the aqueduct. And that's not just because of its visually appealing rows of arcades, but also because of its ingenious construction. In fact, the Pont de Garde was built in a typical Roman ashlar masonry style with the individual blocks cut so perfectly that they could be placed on top of each other without mortar. The pressure exerted by the stones on each other was enough to hold them together. In view of this, it is hardly surprising that the structure was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site as early as 1985, and that the engineers of our modern age are also inspired by the feats of the Romans when it comes to building aqueducts and bridges in rough terrain. At first glance, you might think that the Tunnel of Eupolinos on the Greek island of Samos is just an ordinary ancient passageway. But this casual assessment does not do the construction of it by far justice. In reality, the 1,036 meter long tunnel is nothing less than an absolute masterpiece that commands the utmost respect even from today's experts. This is for the simple yet fascinating reason that the passage represents one of the oldest known tunnels to be built 
using the so-called opposing drive method. In this context, starting from the two tunnel ends, tunnels are driven into the rock, which meet about halfway. The realization of such a project is still considered a technical masterpiece today. After all, there is always the risk that the tunnels in the mountain will ultimately miss each other. It is therefore all the more remarkable that the ancient Greeks succeeded in doing just this as early as the 6th century BC. The careful planning that was essential for this was again the work of the epitomous architect Eupolinos of Megara. But unfortunately, nothing is known about this historical person except her name. What is known, however, is that the tunnel was rediscovered in 1882 and that it once served as part of a water pipe to supply the city of Samos. To do this, water was channeled from a spring at a higher elevation and then fed through a mountain to a reservoir in the city. However, the tunnel, which is about 1.8 meters high and just as wide, was not flooded but accessible because the water itself flowed through a channel in the ground at the side of a corresponding incline. What began with the simple desire for protection eventually led to the construction of the largest and probably most famous structure in the world. The Great Wall of China not only has a truly long history, but at 21,000 kilometers it is also halfway around the world. And although large protective walls had already been built in the 7th century BC, the construction of the Great Wall of China really got underway in 214 BC, according to conventional wisdom. At that time, the first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi, ordered the construction of a perfected defense system to protect against the peoples from the north. The actual implementation of this ambitious plan, in turn, involved connecting existing fortifications, and ultimately, the work was to continue uninterrupted until the 17th century. Whether the term Great Wall is correct, or whether it would not be more appropriate to speak of the Great Walls, is another matter altogether. Strictly speaking, the one wall consists of a system of several sections of different ages, some of which are not even connected to each other. However, it is undisputed that the wall acquired its present-day appearance during the Ming Dynasty, and from the late 15th century onwards, it no longer only ran in valleys or below ridges, but from then on also over hills and mountain ridges. Another special feature of the structure is the approximately 25,000 watchtowers, which served not only as armories but also as important means of communication. Specifically, the beacons lit there announced an enemy attack, but in the same breath, the Great Wall was also intended to prevent Chinese culture from being negatively influenced by the so-called barbarians. It may therefore seem all the more surprising that the Chinese people have suffered greatly from the construction of the wall in some cases. At its peak, up to 20% of the population are said to have been conscripted to work on the construction site under miserable conditions, and some experts estimate that the realization of the XXL project cost several hundred thousand lives. This 1800-year-old lighthouse still shows seafarers the way. Now, that's what we call long-lasting. Although the Tower of Hercules in Acarona, Spain, was built in the 2nd century AD, it is still in use today. In this context, the structure can also be proud of the title of being the oldest intact and operational lighthouse in the world. And that's something to be aware of. Even the wick holder of the original oil lamp, which received its supply of fuel via a ramp running around the tower, can still be admired in the basement of the Hercules Tower today. And while the Tower of Hercules has been guiding seafarers since the time of the Roman Emperor Trajan, it only acquired its present appearance many centuries later. To be precise, the tower was extensively restored between 1788 and 1791 at the behest of the Spanish King Charles IV. Regarding the official name, it should be mentioned again that, according to legend, the lighthouse is said to be enthroned on the very rock where Hercules once fought the giant Giron for three days and nights before finally bringing him to his knees. But isn't it just as legendary, aside from these mythical structures, that the basic design of this ancient UNESCO World Heritage Site is still being taken up today? After all, this venerable testimony to the past is in no way inferior to its modern lighthouse counterparts in terms of height, visibility, and strategic placement. And so it happens that the Tower of Hercules reminds us once again that not every idea automatically becomes obsolete at some point quite the opposite. Some of them are so timelessly good 
that they still have a firm place in our modern world. And if you would like our hidden worlds to have a fixed place on your YouTube homepage, you can easily click on the thumb and subscribe. We warmly invite you to join our community so you can stay up to date with all the latest videos. See you soon.